This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number 47, Crypto Tales. Okay, so, that's a bit loud, I think. Okay, so, um, I'm Samir. Uh, I've been doing crypto stuff for a few years now, so I'm going to tell a bunch of stories about stuff in the crypto industry, stuff that I've done with my company in the past, stuff that other people have done in the crypto industry, some amusing stories you might not have heard before. Um, if anyone has a specific story they'd like to hear that I might know, um, feel free to request a story, because I might know the story and I could tell it, and so that could be fun. Um, and so, I mean, to start off, does anyone have any specific requests to begin with, or should I just come up with my own list of stories to start with? Requests? Okay, so let me come up with a story. Oh, you do, okay. Okay, I don't know that story very well, because I wasn't there, but I can tell that story. Um, so, <coughs> I can make it up, too. <laughs> so, so, apparently, the story is this. It's not a very long story because I wasn't there. So Jim Bid's ass is talking to some NSA people. And so this was actually a long time ago. This was probably in 92 or 93 or something like that. Long time ago in the grand scale of things, of course. And, um, and of course, RSA has had an interesting relationship with the NSA because, of course, they always get export license. They've, they've, all, they've made all for the um, crippled cryptography and stuff. So they have to maintain a good relationship with the NSA. But, of course, they also have to maintain a good with the crypto community and claim and <clears throat> have a very antagonistic attitude with the NSA in the public eye. So it creates an interesting perspective because RSA has to kiss NSA ass on one side and they also have to kick their ass on the other side. So <clears throat> I'm not sure if this was actually the case back when this happened, but apparently Jim Bidzos likes to tell this story of how when at one point he was talking to some NSA guys and they were being assholes to him and he was being an asshole to them and then they just said rather casually uh, that they could just fix this out in the parking lot with a car running over him and so he didn't appreciate that very much and so he started telling lots of people and people were kind of amused by that and it was kind of hard to say whether or not that was an actual death threat from the NSA, whether or not Jim Bidzas just invented that story for his own personal amusement, or for his own personal advantage, or if they were just joking and just like, whatever, we're really not going to kill you, you're just a dumbass if you think we're going to kill you kind of thing. So, that was the Jim Bidzas story. So, okay, um, <coughs> let's see, so I started my company C2Net in 1994 as an internet service provider, internet privacy company. So what I was doing then was I started the company in 94 because I was living in California, I had been living in California for about a year and I was going to all the cypherpunks meetings and all of these people were saying, oh we're going to implement anonymous technology and the government's going to be irrelevant and we're all going to have a lovely anarchy and life will be great and everything will be hunky-dory and we won't have to pay taxes and it will all be good. But all of these people were like, okay, this is all going to happen and they said, oh, all this cryptography technology is going to make all of this stuff happen. But they, see, they thought that angels from the sky were going to come down and just tap their magic wand and then all this technology would exist and it would be deployed and people would use it and people would make money and they wouldn't have to pay taxes and it would be all good. But of course, I knew that that was never going to happen. There are no angels who are going to come down from the sky to solve all our problems for us. So I started my company in 94 uh, to solve those problems, hopefully. And, <coughs> and so that's, so I started that in 94 and <coughs> it was kind of fun. We did anonymous web hosting, anonymous site, um, anonymous uh, anonymous mail, anonymous uh, the yeah, anonymous mail, anonymous web hosting, um, anonymous pseudonyms. Um, we did a lot of the pseudonym stuff is very similar um, in design to the mail services done by Zero Knowledge today. They're actually doing a company which will make some money at it as opposed to my company which didn't. But um, 
the basic idea is that your mail gets forwarded to a bunch of different hops so that it can't be traced. Now, I built this system because the, the traditional anonymous servers, such as anon.pnet.fi, were built with a very similar point of failure in them. If you had an account in anon.pnet.fi and say someone like the Scientologists wanted to find out who you were, all they had to do was go to Finland, spend lots of money on bribing the Finnish government or whatever you have to do in Finland to get your way, and then what they end up doing is getting access to your real identity because they use this, it's all, all of the actual sensitive information is actually stored in one place and all you have to do is break into the computer or subpoena the computer or whatever and you get all the sensitive information and that's not very safe. So I set up the system so that even if my server was subpoenaed, I wouldn't actually be revealing the real identities of the anonymous users. So I set up the system and people started using it and it was all good. Um, and people were using the non.pnet.fi system because it was a lot easier to use. So my system was being used by the ultra-paranoid, and the non.pnet.fi system was being used by the less paranoid. And so it was all good. There was a nice marketplace for anonymity in the community. But then the Scientologists actually did spend a lot of money, and they went to a non.pnet.fi, and they <coughs> convinced the Finnish government to at first they wanted to get the entire database of all the anonymous identities mapped to real identities. And the Finnish government has much stronger protections for privacy than the US government has, so they actually, it was actually very difficult for the Scientologists to get that information. They had to go to court many times and spend lots of money on legal bills. I'm sure the Scientologists' lawyers were happy with that situation because they made lots of money off the deal. But, um, so it was a lot of work, and in the end, the Finnish government did end up caving, but they didn't reveal, they didn't want to give up the entire database. They said, well, you're only looking for two guys, so we're just going to force um, pnet.fi to reveal the two guys. So the Finnish government eventually caved in, and Johan Gulf was uh, forcing this who was running pnet.fi was pretty much devastated by this. He had previously thought that his security model was going to work because the Finnish government was on his side. He later learned, of course, that the Finnish government wasn't on his side. They only had these laws because as one level of protection against the attack, but of course the Scientologists managed to breach that level of protection, the Finnish laws he was relying upon. So because he was so upset over this, he shut down the PNFI server, and now no one can use the PNFI server, because he didn't want to give people a false sense of, of security. Um, what I was saying, what I was doing in order to try to market my product was of course saying that he was giving people a false sense of security, but in fact, as long as it's marketed right, it's not a false sense of security, you just know how much security you're getting. And you can either go to pnetfi if you want something that's easy to use, or you go to my server <coughs> running at um, alpha.c2.org if you want actual security that can withstand the Scientology attack. So, so it was shut down, everyone was upset, there was all sorts of clamor, no, no, it's being shut down, the Scientologists suck, we should kick their asses, you know, whatever. Um, <coughs> He eventually got an EFF Pioneer Award, which was all good. We we're all very proud of him for that. And, um, and then you know, things, things eventually slowly died down. My company changed focus, <coughs> um, which I'll get to later. And, <coughs> but after about three years or so, according to Finnish law, the, uh, after three years, the records for an investigation need to be opened up. So the Finnish government released the records for the investigation, and the records included the real identities of the people the Scientologists spent a lot of money trying to get. And it turns out that the so-called real identities hidden by the peanut.fi service were actually pointing at my pseudonymous server, which there would have been no way the Scientologists would have gotten with that. And they could have tried to sue me. They, they never actually contacted me, so I figure they knew that they would have had no hope if they tried contacting me, because I actually probably wouldn't even needed a subpoena at that point, I would have just given them some cipher text which they couldn't decrypt. And I probably would have asked for a subpoena because it would have cost them more money and it's always good to make the Scientologists pay. So, <coughs> so that's, so that was pretty cool because we knew that the Scientologists spent huge amounts of money trying to get that information and then they couldn't get it. <coughs> so, I'm another Scientology story, this one's kind of amusing. Um, 
<laughs> it's not really crypto related, but it's still kind of cool. A friend of mine was working um, as like a network engineer at Ares Internet on the East Coast. And they had a customer the Scientologist didn't like. So they called them up. They called him up. And he was just the guy who answered the phone at the time. Because it's a small company, you know, you don't have they didn't have huge banks of tech support people answering the phone or anything like that back then. So, so anyway, he answers the phone. He says, you know, they say the Scientologists are like, oh, well, you have to talk to our legal department. And then they go to the legal department. The Scientologists eventually sue Arrow's internet. And they, of course, name my friend as one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit because he picked up the phone. And, and so anyway, whatever, they sue Arrow's internet. Like, the case gets dropped or whatever, they settle, I don't know exactly what happened. But then, a few years later, my friend stops working for Arizona Internet. He's working for a company in San Francisco. He, he's walking around San Francisco one day and he sees a Scientology store in San Francisco. He's like, ah, oh, cool, I'm going to go into the Scientology store and uh, see, what, see what I can do, or, like buy Dianetics or something similar like that. So he goes into the Scientology store and this guy, this person at the counter, she looks at him and she's like, hey, aren't you that ISP guy? And so then he gets really scared and he turns around and runs away. <laughs> okay, so, so let's see. So I was running an internet service and so people would get accounts and all of this sort of thing. And in 1996, I came out with a product called Stronghold, which is a, um, a web server based on Apache, which adds SSL capabilities. At the time, the only value was that it added SSL capabilities. Now, there's like lots of marketing literature about what other value it adds. But at the time, all we did was adding SSL to Apache. And, <coughs> And so the company, at, at that point, the company wasn't really making any money off the web hosting and the anonymous mail services and that sort of thing. I still had a day job. I was contracting an SGI and all sorts of things. So, so I knew that the software business was going to make lots of money and the services business wasn't making lots of money. I would have had to invest heavily into that. The margins were low, all sorts of things like that. So I, wanted, I, I was migrating off of that. And then November 1996 rolls around. And I go to this conference in Florida, whatever. It was a pretty boring conference. But by the time I'm done with the conference, I'd gotten all these business leads. I was really hyped. I was really psyched about doing business. I had set up, by that point, offshore development centers all over the world. And I was thinking, well, what could the NSA do to shut me down? And I realized that since I was still doing web hosting, they could just plant some child porn on my site and you know go after me for child porn, and that would suck. So. So I'm thinking, okay, I really need to finish that whole migration away from web hosting because that's sort of a liability. And then I get home. I'm in the, I'm in the office on Monday. And we just moved into a new office. And so the office is all still in shambles. You know, I'm still I'm putting together my desk and all of this. And some guy walks in, he hands me a sheaf of papers, and he says, you are served. I'm like, hmm, what's this? And it turns out that we've been sued for contributory copyright infringement by Adobe Traveling Software and one other company whose, whose name escapes me. But anyway, they'd sued me, for contributory, sued me and my company for contributory copyright infringement, which is not child porn, but it was based on the fact that we had some customers um, hosting web pages on our site that had allegedly um, material which the SPA, the Software Publishers Association, considered to be contributory copyright infringement. So those three things were <coughs> serial numbers for Wales, information about how to get, how to crack copy protection, and links to sites which host Wales. They didn't actually claim that we had any Wales on our site. They only claimed that we had links and information. So, and of course, the reason they had sued me, which I later learned, is that a few months prior to this, they had sent out an email to a large number of internet providers who apparently they knew had some sort of wares or links to wares or whatever on their site. And their email basically said, please give us a call and we'll sue you. So I never got that email apparently. Maybe my mail server was flaky or whatever. I didn't know what was going on. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, all the ISPs who did get that email, they all called up the SPA, and then the SPA's response was, sign this code of conduct and we won't sue you. And this code of conduct the SPA wanted people to sign was pretty heinous. 
And basically, it required that the internet providers monitor everything every one of their users did. And at, at that point, the uh, the various lawsuits had been resolved, which sh showed that an ISP is not liable as long as they don't monitor and uh, moderate their traffic. So by, moderate, by monitoring traffic and agreeing to this code of conduct, ISPs were actually signing up for more liability than they had in the first place. So people actually, most of the providers who, did, who received that comment from the SPA, please sign this code of conduct and we won't sue you, did decide to sign the code of conduct because they were afraid of the SPA. Two providers, GeoCities and Tripod, didn't sign. They were like, this is bogus, we're not going to sign this. And so they didn't sign. And I, of course, didn't sign because I had no clue that they wanted me to sign this stupid code of conduct. So GeoCities, Tripod, and C2Net all received this lawsuit. And it was very clear from their announcements, from their tactics, that the lawsuit was not meant in any way to actually go to court or actually be concerned with the fact that we had, we allegedly had contributory copyright material on our sites. They just sued because they wanted us to settle, sign the code of conduct, and then they would drop the lawsuit. And so they, they dropped the lawsuit on GeoCities and Tripod, and GeoCities and Tripod both decided to settle. And they um, were in the course of negotiating with investors and things along those lines, and they didn't want the investors to be afraid of the lawsuit and all that sort of thing. And so they negotiated with the SPA and settled by signing a code of conduct, which actually, which actually wasn't heinous. So they did settle, which I think was kind of lame, but they didn't actually sign a code of conduct which actually restricted them in any way. The code of conduct basically said, we will obey the law. Well, duh. Um, so it wasn't anything new. But I was kind of frustrated that they did settle because, of course, the SPA could then claim the victory. I, of course, didn't settle. Um, Yes, I had. Uh, I called up my friend, my God, at the FF, and I was like, "Help! What do I do?" And so he referred me to a very good attorney in San Francisco, and we told the SPA that they were smoking crack. Um, <laughs> at first, they wouldn't even tell us which ones of our customers had the contri allegedly contributory copyright material. So, well, the first thing is that what they claimed was contributory copyright was in fact protected speech. So if they wanted to take this to court, and if we did in fact have what they claimed was on the site, we would have taken it to court and we would have won. But, and they probably knew this. But of course they weren't interested in going to court, they were just interested in getting some press and having a bunch of people sign their stupid little code of conduct. And so, so we, so it wasn't actually the SPA that sued us, of course, because the SPA itself is just a trade organization that has no standing. What the SPA does is they have a bunch of member organizations, and many of their member organizations sign over power of attorney to the SPA so that the SPA can sue other people on their behalf. So the fact was Adobe and Traveling Software didn't even know that they had sued me. So we called up Adobe, and we're like, why are you suing us? This is so anti-internet, and Adobe was all into this web publishing thing, so like, we're not anti-internet, we didn't know about this lawsuit, we avow all knowledge of this lawsuit. The SPA sucks. They didn't say that, you know, but... Um, and we didn't actually get significant contacts at Traveling Software or the third company, which name I don't recall. Actually, they misspelled Traveling Software's name in the lawsuit, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, so, so we didn't even know which one of our customers had the allegedly contributory copyright material on the site. So my attorney calls them up and he's like, well, you know, you claim that they've got contributory copyright into infringement material on the site. Why don't you tell us which customers... At first they alleged that I and my company were actually engaged in contributory copyright infringement because that's actually what the lawsuit said. It didn't say that I was liable for the acts of my customers, which they implied, but which they meant to say, but they actually said I was doing contributory copyright infringement. So anyway, um, they... I tried to give him a call and said, well, which one of these customers are doing the contributory copyright infringement? And the person, the, the attorney who actually sued me on this case was like, um, hmm, I don't know. Let me get back to you on that. So 
after much harassment, um, they eventually told us who it was. They were these two random customers of ours. And, um, and so then I went to go look at their website. And all I found on those websites was the alt binaries where's FAQ. And so that was clearly protected speech. So we told them, you guys are on crack. This is all protected speech. Um, you guys need to drop the lawsuit. And then it was about, they'd sued us. They filed for the lawsuit and served notice to me on one day, and I believe we had 21 days to file a response. And of course, filing a response would have been pretty expensive, and I didn't want to spend the money, so I didn't actually tell our attorney to actually start writing the response. So it was about five days before we had to file the response. And our attorney was just telling them, well, you know, you guys really need to drop the lawsuit because if I start working on following the response and then we counter sue you, you guys are going to be liable for my legal fees and it's not going to be cheap. So they dropped the lawsuit. Um, but they, they dropped the lawsuit without prejudice, which basically means that they reserved the right to file it again. They claimed that they dropped the lawsuit because there was confusion over whether or not I had received that initial email. Not because they had no case and they were total dumbasses. But they claimed that, okay, we're dropping this lawsuit as a good faith measure, but we still want you to sign the code of conduct. And if you don't sign the code of conduct, we might file the lawsuit again. And I told them that they needed to apologize and re recover my legal fees before I would even answer their telephone calls. And they didn't apologize, they didn't give me my legal fees back, and of course they didn't sue me again because they had no case. So, it turned out after this uh, <coughs> lovely adventure, I learned that of all of the SPA members, the only three SPA members that had given me SPA power of attorney were those three companies that had sued me. So, I'm not going to get into the details of the SPA, but... No, they didn't. They didn't apologize and they didn't give me any money. I would have preferred, if I had to pick one or the other, the apology or the money, I would have picked the apology because it wasn't a whole lot of money and I got a lot of press out of it, so I thought it was cool. Um, but I really thought that if, because they didn't apologize, that other internet providers were at risk of them doing the same thing to them. And that was just clearly a bad situation. So if they apologized and acknowledged the fact that what they did was wrong, that they sued me just because they wanted me to sign a code of conduct and it was just a total bullying tactic, then I thought, okay, these people maybe are seeing the light of day and I'll talk to them on a reasonable basis as a human to a human, as opposed to <coughs> treating them like the scum they are. So, <coughs> so anyway, that was the... Uh, so I later learned that the only three companies that now that at that point had given the SPA power of attorney to sue were those three companies. So I guess they're sort of losing respectability within their customer base, which is a good thing. Um, because of course, <coughs> software piracy isn't such a good thing. I've made a significant amount of money selling software and I don't like my software pirates. So <coughs> um, the SPA not being the organization to protect against privacy is a good piracy it was a good thing. It was kind of amusing because I was a privacy company, so I'd always say piracy, but I'd say privacy by mistake, and it would be all very confusing. So, anyway, that's the SPA story. Um, let's see, more stories. Fourth of July. What's the Fourth of July story? Oh yeah, okay. I'll tell that story. That story's kind of fun. So anyway, so I'm. Um, this is 1997, and oh, I'll tell the other. The, this is I'll tell the earlier 97 media story first because it's kind of funny. So in May 96, um, and early 97, I and a bunch of friends and a bunch of people from, from C2, we would always go to a, um, a breakfast brunch Thai at the Thai Temple in Berkeley every Sunday morning. So we were at, I was there, and one day a bunch of <coughs> new people who I'd never met before from Japan were there, and they were all chatting, and they were apparently from the press, and they were doing, they were doing a, uh, a what? A documentary on, on cryptography. So I was like, okay, cool, I got the name and all of this stuff. 
and then they went back to Japan, did some more research, came back, and then they decided they wanted to cover C2Net and PGP. So they allocated two weeks to cover PGP and two weeks to cover C2Net. And the first two weeks they allocated was the first two weeks of February, and that was PGP, so they covered PGP during that time. And then the second two weeks was the... Um, was they were covering C2Net. But we told them, well, if you're covering us, that's not going to work so well because the first week is fine because we're going to be in the office and you can film us and whatever. We can take interviews and all this. But the next week, we're going to a conference in Angola. And Angola is a small island three miles from St. Martin in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, it takes 15 hours to get there. You have to take a small little plane to get there. There's only about 8,000 people who live there. They have no taxes. Um, we were going to a conference there. And so we told them, well, you know, it would be great if you filmed this and all, but we're going to this conference. So they call back to the home office. They're like, can we go to Angola? The home office says yes. <laughs> so they fly to Angola before we do. <clears throat> but I didn't know this. I just thought, okay, they're back in the hotel, they'll be in Angola, they'll be filming us, it'll be all good. Um, so we're getting off the plane in Angola. It's you know a small little plane, so we have to climb down the stairs under the tarmac. I look out at the terminal, and there's this really bright light flashing in my face. I'm like, what's that? Oh, it's a camera. Oh, that's the NHK guys. So we filmed walking off the plane, in total crypto rock star experience. And so that was a lot of fun. And so then... And they were hanging out with us for over the course of the next week, filming us in Angola, and it was really cool. I was interviewed while sitting on a porch with Saint Martin in the back, and my hair was blowing, and it was just the total lush crypto um, crypto interview. And they they showed that eventually on uh, Japanese television, on the national like PBS equivalent in Japan. So. Then later on in the year, um, you know, we were continuing to do public relations and build press. And there was this guy from Forbes, who at first was supposed to be doing an article on electronic commerce and Visa and SET and all of this. So he started talking to a bunch of people in the crypto community. And he realized after talking to a bunch of people in the crypto community that SET and Visa and electronic commerce are all really boring. And the really interesting thing is tax evasion. Tax avoidance, sorry. So, so he's like, oh, I'm going to talk to all these cypherpunks who are really interested in tax avoidance. And by that point, I had grown old and jaded, and I wasn't really interested in tax avoidance. I just wanted to make lots of money. Um, but he wanted to do an article on tax avoidance. So, but of course, I was still an anarchist libertarian. I just realized that there was no way I was ever going to win. Um, so anyway, he, he talked to a bunch of people in the crypto community, and they're like, oh, you should talk to Samir. So he's like, okay, he comes and talks to me. So he talks to me on Friday, July 3rd at the office. And we chat, and we have a good time. We talk for like two, three hours or something like that, and it's time to go home because I have like a meeting or whatever. And so he's like, oh, I still need to talk to you some more. Can we talk tomorrow? So we get together in a cafe in Berkeley, and <clears throat> something to us, July 4th. Cool, it's a holiday. So anyway, so we go, we meet in this cafe, and we're sitting down, and I'm like, oh, I like this holiday. You get to celebrate overthrowing the government. And I thought, okay. So he interviewed me, and it was all good. And then a few weeks later, um, actually, a week, yeah, a few weeks later, um, a photographer came, and he took my picture. He took pictures of other cypherpunks, and, you know, it was all good. Um, and then I got an email from from him sometime in early September or late August saying the final issues of um, the, the magazine, the first pressing is off the press or whatever, I'm sending it to you by next day mail, I think you'll get a kick out of it. So he sent it to me on Friday. I was actually in the office on Saturday because I was working on some web pages or whatever. And I show up at the office, <coughs> one of my coworkers had already been there, and uh, and then he throws this magazine on my desk, which has this picture of me on it, and it says, this guy wants to overthrow the government. <laughs> so, I'm thinking, wow, that's wild. <laughs> so I open up the magazine, I'm like, oh, where's the article? This is really weird. And I look at the article, and it starts out saying, I like this holiday. You get to celebrate overthrowing the government. <laughs> And so that was pretty cool. Um, the, uh, and the article was just an excellent article. It talked about how tax avoidance was the patriotic thing to do and all sorts of things like that. It put um, 
it, it had a really good page layout system because every every uh, every spread on the left would be a picture of a cypherpunk who talked about how tax avoidance was a good thing, and on the right there was a picture of some big wig banker like the head of Citibank talking about how tax avoidance was a good thing. <laughs> so it was a really balanced perspective. You've got the radical wackos like us, and then you've got you know the straight conservative people who are all into it as well. So. So it was a pretty good article. I had a lot of fun. Um, everyone made a lot of fun. Oh, it looks like I'm out of time. So, thank you.